All right, and now we're joined by Sally Bagshaw, who's running for City Council District 7. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thank you very much. So I live downtown and have for the last 15 years. I'm a member of the 43 Democrats and a dues-paying member of the 36th. And since uh, the District 7 covers both 43rd and 36th, it's important um, to come and ask for your endorsement again. So the areas that I'm most interested in um, affordable housing, obviously, equity, making and creating an equitable city, having one that is vibrant across the city and fair and accessible for everyone. And I'm most focused now on the affordable housing, public safety, and transportation. And many of you know that we're going to have transportation levy on the ballot in November, so I fully anticipate working on that um, between now and November to make sure that that passes. So I will just stop there and proceed with questions. All right, great. So we have uh, four prepared questions, and actually I think they're right in front of you if you want to read along as we say them aloud. And I think we left off. Janet, will you do number one? These are two-minute answers. So Seattle is experiencing housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. <coughs> what is your approach to keeping Seattle well, I think the mayor is on right on track with his Howard committee. That's the housing affordability and livability agenda. He's brought people together from all across the spectrum. Those who are living in very low income now, uh, people who are building it, people who are actually looking to find an affordable place to live that are gainfully employed. So I think that there's a lot of things that we can do, but there's no one silver bullet. As we talked recently, there is silver buckshot. And the kinds of things that I do think that we need to look into that we haven't yet is inclusionary zoning. And inclusionary zoning by design requires builders to include a certain number of affordable units as they're building their apartments. And it's not something that Seattle has really gotten too deeply engaged in, but other cities in our region have. Um, Bellevue, Kirkland, Issaquah, Redmond have done well with inclusionary zoning. Uh, I think that that's one of the tools that we haven't discussed that we can use. Um, I'm also thinking uh, of another tool that the state law allows is impact fees. And impact fees, as new things and areas are developed, can be used for transportation and parks and public education and like, fire um, and <coughs> response uh, capital money. So I think those are some things we can look at as far as rent control goes. Many of us know and have been to New York and San Francisco and seen that the first generation of rent control hasn't worked effectively, but there may be ways of looking at that in the future. So um, I would focus on our transportation infrastructure and build around our transit nodes. We have our urban centers and our um, uh, urban areas where we do have uh, infill possibilities. And I think in South Seattle, along Aurora in, in particular, that we can find places for taller buildings, rezone or allow a spot zoning, and get a larger number of people into the smaller spaces uh, in a dense way. One uh, very specific example I'm working with Sound Transit right now is at Madison and Boylston. And we're looking at building some uh, very low income housing for veterans and for those that have so many challenges. Uh, the sound grants, and it's something that we can do and make a difference. Uh, Clayton, number two. <clears throat> Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how will you fund the full implementation of the program? And what policy changes would you make to ensure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? Well, the universal preschool is something that I support, um, and I believe that we will have a pilot that we can really test, have the data to demonstrate as universal pre the high-quality universal pre-Ks have shown in other states, Massachusetts, New Jersey, um, and even Washington, D.C. Um, it's something that we know can work for families that don't have the same ability to access good quality preschool. So we need the help from the state. We've all talked about the McQuarrie decision, and the state itself is saying that from a constitutional standpoint, it's the number one thing that we need to be doing. I think uh, we need to be funding universal pre-K through um, our 13th year, that every family 
families should have an opportunity to go to good quality schools through the first year of college. And whether that's adding running start or simply a 13th year in school, that's something that we need to do. Full funding cannot be held um, as the city of Seattle's taxpayers' responsibility only. We really need to, need to work with the state on that. So that's where I would go. Thank you. John, number three. <clears throat> so Huerta is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and an unsafe viaduct? So Bertha is not stuck at this moment. The faces come off. They're working on um, redoing the teeth and putting some extra strength behind the, the bearing. Everything that we see in front and what we hear is that that is going to get going. The south end and the north end of the portals have both been completed. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Nice to see you. And uh, my belief, based upon what we're hearing from the engineers, is that Bertha will be digging and it will be digging within the next year, which is good. Now, if all heck breaks loose and we are unable to move forward, there is a $500 million performance bond that was part of the contract. And there are other contractors that can do this work. Now, I'm not saying that that's preferable, but that is an option that the city and the state have. And remember, this is a state contract, not the city. So we would look to Washtenaw to do that. Now, as far as overruns go, drafted in the original contract and legislation is that that's not the burden of the city taxpayers. We need to move forward uh, because the viaduct is coming down either neatly or not so neatly in the case of an earthquake. So all of the things that we've been talking about with fixing transportation, making sure there's more transit is something that the city is working with very closely with the state, um, but we definitely need more of that. And that's where I would be doing And if we could put in double, triple what the state's talking about in the transportation package, I would do that. Okay. Elizabeth, number four. <clears throat> Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? Well, the people that are coming here, we expect another 100,000 of them. We want to encourage them because the numbers show that those are our kids and grandkids. And we want them here. So everything that we need to be focused on is about making an affordable, livable city. And the questions that you've already asked about, how do we increase density and how do we address that is critical. Um, the transportation network so that trucks can get where they need to go. People who are driving their cars can get where they need to go. Improved transit is the number one thing that as a region we need to be focusing on. And then I'm a huge fan of bicycles and pedestrians and having separated neighborhood greenways and bike lanes for those of us who do ride. And I do ride my bike. I can get anywhere downtown faster on my bike than I can in the car. So I believe that that's something that we need to focus on. But um, of course we've got to encourage them because they're coming and we can't lock the door. It's not one of those situations where I'm up, pull up the ladder. We all need to figure out a way to make room. So we shall. Great, so now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. Um, I have one, then Elizabeth, then Clayton, is that a hand? Yes. So this is a question that was submitted by one of our members who asked uh, if she could submit a question. So it is basically, um, what, if any, legislation have you passed in the past or plan to pass in the future that addresses or mitigates the continuing climate crisis? Well, um, I have been working very closely on this Arctic drilling and to do what we can to encourage the port to review that. And I think that's something that as a city, we can't tell the port not to do it, but we can, and as you saw the mayor yesterday, opening the doors to say, should we reconsider this? Um, I was at the climate change breakfast yesterday morning where the mayor made that announcement and I'm, I'm pleased with that. So a broader, as far as climate change goes, I've been very active in um, our neighborhood greenway movement to provide spaces for pedestrians and bikes to be safely separated from cars. Worked on green energy <coughs> um, buildings and of course the big thing that I did last year was to help our parks um, legacy pass. And so now that we'll have a Seattle Park District with a very sustainable way of taking care of the 6,200 acres of parks that we have, that I'm really proud of. Uh, we made a big stride, and as I mentioned recently, um, 
not everybody can afford to join the tennis club or join the yacht club, but we do have parks for everybody. Elizabeth actually stole my question. It was about the, <laughs> <laughs> the shell deal with Clayton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Seattle Housing Authority. Yeah. And the question is whether, whether the structure of the Seattle Housing Authority can be changed to make the Seattle Housing Authority a more dynamic, responsive tool to address um, the housing affordability. Question. Because it's a semi, it's a semi-autonomous it entity. It's it's the outer Mongolia of uh, city bureaucracies, as, <laughs> as it appears to me. Yeah, it's really not even part of us. We identify people to serve on their board, but we don't have any control over what they do. Um, the answer is yes, of course. And structures can always be changed. When I was in King County, and many of you know, I was. Uh, the chief civil deputy for the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, which meant that I provided legal advice to all of the departments within King County. We did some restructuring on King County housing, and I think that they were more responsive to the tenants, more responsive to the need, um, really listening to the tenants, bringing them in and talking about what is it that they need, what is it that they want, and how can we serve them better. Um, and I think that's something that Seattle Housing Authority needs to do as well. We saw just the bitterness that came when they wanted to require people to have a $19 an hour wage in a few years when there's some people that they just I mean, had no way that they could commit to earning that kind of money. So I think the answer is yes, but it would take all of us. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions? James? Sure. So you've been uh, on the city council quite a while, so you've Six had, years. <laughs> had a chance to watch um, what is a challenging funding environment, and in some ways the degradation of some of our social supports in the city. And at this point, many of us are looking at services in the north end, which are becoming more and more um, high need as more and more people are forced out of Seattle, and as more and more affordable housing is built in Lake City or the north end. And yet, there's a dearth of social services in that area. Um, what do you believe is a priority as we look at things like aging adult services and family support, which we have little bit of either in the North End? So, uh, providing the coordinated human services is something that I mentioned in my opening statement that is really critical. And I know that the city is changing a lot. And we're seeing more and more people coming in without the support, without the family, without the structure we have. And up even further north, there are seniors that are living in conditions that I wouldn't want to put my hands in. So we do need to coordinate the services with King County. It's a regional thing. And it's one of my concerns about district elections, and I've mentioned this to many of you in the past, is that district elections, we've got to be careful that it doesn't become award sort of politics. We really need to be thinking as a region mm -hmm. and focusing with King County, making sure that Seattle, King County, and all of the suburban cities are doing their fair share. Okay. Michael and Joseph. Um, that kind of segues nicely into my question, actually. Um, uh, in your current role as an at-large member, you've been able to focus on big picture issues. Right. How do you see that role changing under the district system? Well, it's already changing, no question. We have people calling and saying, well, you're my district council member now. <laughs> okay, um, and one example, um, and Mary and I were just talking about this earlier, I'm getting calls from parents um, about schools and about their schools. And so what I've done in the last year is to go and meet the principals of the local schools on Queen Anne and Magnolia and to commit to them that if an issue comes up that I will talk to that principal and make sure that I'm directing the parents back to the principal first, you know, just sort of de-escalate the concerns. But we're, that's just a, one example. I see this all the time, people calling up and saying, my stoplight doesn't work, or I hate Mercer the way, why aren't you doing something about that? So I think that is a big issue, but we cannot lose sight of our regional coordination. My concern is that if we should do that, then we then find ourselves balkanized. Um, and no big international city is doing well by itself. It's got to work with its partners, and I'm committed to doing that. Yeah. Also, a nice segue into my question. Um, so, of our peer cities, which is one that you think is um, doing a better job in a particular policy area 
no matter what that may be. Um, and that's something that we could readily emulate here in the next decade or so. Well, let's look at what Vancouver, BC has done. They created, um, and I'm, I'm making this up off the top of my head here, but one of the things I liked about Vancouver when I was up there, um, they've done a really good job of helping people get around. And with affordable housing, they, they have looked at ADUs and DADUs in a way differently than we have. You know, we've, we've kind of tiptoed around the, the um, dwelling unit in our backyard approach. But years ago, they said, we're going to open it up in single-family neighborhoods if somebody wants to have an auxiliary dwelling unit in their backyard or to put a detached one next to their garage. They allow people to do that, um, and they don't require parking. So, God bless you. Excuse so that's me. one of the areas I think that they've done more successfully. They're roughly the same size that we are. They're accommodating um, more places for people. And it's a big deal for seniors. I mean, going back to one of the issues that you just raised was seniors sometimes get uh, forced out of their homes because they simply don't have the money to keep them going. And so allowing somebody to move into a basement or into an auxiliary in a garage helps provide additional income. So I'm pretty impressed with that. Time for another question or two. Okay, Michael, and then Clayton. Uh, what's your position on um, City Initiative 122, the honest elections um, and the City Initiative? Yeah, I'm, st I'm still learning about that. I, I haven't formulated a, a decision yet. I think there's some elements that are really good and there's some things that concern me. Um, I lived in Vancouver for seven years. Um, was first licensed as an architect up here. Um, and so I appreciate your response very much. Uh, however, Vancouver has several things that we do not have. Uh, an English planning tradition, uh, a parliamentary system of government, uh, Hong Kong moving to Vancouver um, with much cash. Um, and so when we, when we, and also a, maybe a more progressive planning um, attitude, but, but the question is what, what things we can do given, given the absence of these intervening variables um, uh, that we, we do not have at the moment, or have not found. Um, when you say intervening variables, what do you mean? I mean the things that I enumerated. Um, we don't have Hong Kong moving here. We don't have, I mean, the with this deluge of cash that built the, the, uh, the towers in, in the west end of Vancouver. And, and uh, we don't have, uh, yet, anyway, we don't have the Olympics coming here, which built the, a lot of the, uh, not all, but a lot of the uh, transit system. So, so the question, the question, I mean, I appreciate your answer very much, but the question devolves to, or returns to, to what we can do. I mean, one thing, one thing we might look at, possibly, is, is civic architecture and the quality thereof. Uh, because when you look at civic buildings up there, they are of very high quality. Uh, when you look at them down here, they're of frequently meatball quality. Uh, so, like the King County Administration building. <laughs> Yeah. That's sub meatball. <laughs> That's spam. It's spam ball. <laughs> so, so was that enough? Was that, was that a question mark? Or yeah. question mark? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm sorry if everyone dozed off. <laughs> so, so we have about sixty seconds. So yeah, let's talk about the planning commission. I'm not sure where to take that. No, the question is the question is very simple. And excuse, I ask the Quickly. patients, we're not Vancouver, we're Seattle, we're 200,000 fewer people with all of these things that we don't have. So, so I, I ask for a return to a focus to what we do have in your response. Well, we do have Amazon. While well, remembering okay. that example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot of businesses that are coming in here, Amazon being one of the primary. You see what Vulcan is doing down in South Lake Union. One of the issues that I was working on last year was making sure that we didn't have big buildings coming in where 
people had been promised a zoning cap. But at the same time, we had Vulcan, for example, coming in and saying, we want to build right on the edge of South Lake Union and go significantly higher, 240 feet or even 360 in some examples. And I had some of my favorite architects just pounding on me, you've got to let us do that because it will make a much more interesting looking city. And I think in some ways that's true, but we've also promised to step down to the water to try to democratize the use. So it's a, it's a complicated issue, no question. All right, so we are out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, I would like to ask for the 36 endorsement. It's important to me. You endorsed me during my last election. I appreciate how good you are at local neighborhood issues, and um, I would be very pleased to have your endorsement again. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.